Hi guys, my name is Jack, and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. A complex crime. The incident that occurred in late summer 2016 at Spring Creek Park sparked a wave of public outrage. How many similar tragedies must happen before New York City authorities listen to the citizens' pleas? Local residents had repeatedly alerted authorities about the presence of unsettling individuals in the park. Some of them would gather in groups while others wandered alone. Either way, their appearance evoked a sense of danger. Regrettably, it took a crime for the city administration to finally take action and address this issue. Additionally, the event led to numerous discussions and topics about the safety of female runners, particularly those who exercise alone. According to a survey, 54% of women feel anxious when they go out, fearing they might be subjected to verbal harassment or physical attacks. The story of Karina Vetrano is both horrifying and baffling, firstly because nothing seemed amiss on the day of the fateful event. The attack on the woman occurred in broad daylight, in a fairly populated area. Secondly, her death has a mystical aspect to it. And thirdly, the investigation of the case, as well as the sentencing of the perpetrator, raised many questions. On Tuesday, August 2nd, 2016, Karina arranged to meet her father after work. They wanted to spend time together. Since Miss Vetrano had moved, family gatherings had become rare because everyone was busy with their own things. In addition, the young woman was combining two jobs. Philip picked up his daughter and took her to his home. There, the family shared their impressions of the past week. When Karina was about to go home, she asked her father if he wanted to go jogging with her, as they often did, covering several miles together. Her father replied that he couldn't this time. You see, my back hurts so badly that nothing helps. Maybe a new prescription is needed. Or maybe it's the change in the weather, Mr. Vetrano explained. Maybe I should call you a cab. The weather was beautiful, the heat had abated, and there was a fresh smell in the air. Therefore, Karina declined the offer. Besides, she was training for the upcoming marathon. The young woman had recently broken up with her boyfriend and wanted to distract herself. A jog would clearly do her good. That evening was the last time the parents saw their youngest daughter. At 5.45 p.m., she left the house for a jog. Her first stop was Spring Creek Park, a cozy, tranquil place buried in greenery. A true paradise amongst the city's infrastructure. However, only part of the park was available for walking. The rest was covered with thickets and swamps. Mr. Vetrano asked his daughter to stick to her usual route, to stay away from unfamiliar paths and people. Unfortunately, Karina ignored his advice. In search of solitude, she decided to go to a grassy, deserted place. Karina's thoughts were abruptly interrupted. She felt a sharp pain in the back of her head, and she fell down. This rash decision cost the young woman her life. A frightening uncertainty entered the Vetrano home. It had been two hours since they had said goodbye to their youngest daughter. She should have been home by now, or at least answering the calls of her parents, who were frantically trying to reach her. And she had promised to keep her cell phone to herself. The anxiety was growing. Her father sensed that something was wrong and decided to seek help from his neighbor the chief of the New York City Police Department. They were on good terms, and the high-ranking official knew that Philip would not make a fuss over nothing. After that, Karina Vetrano was reported missing. Police began searching for the young woman, combing the park area and surrounding streets. As a result, experienced canine units were brought in. As it is known, the first 24 hours after the disappearance of a person are crucial and most informative. Therefore, law enforcement utilized all available resources before nightfall. At the same time, Mr. Vetrano, along with a group of volunteers, searched for his daughter on his own. He scoured the park from end to end, combing the paths and wading through the tall grass, all the while making phone calls. As dusk fell, the man noticed a light in the grass. As he approached, he recognized Karina's phone. Maybe she lost her cell phone and just didn't let us know, Philip hoped. 
The patriarch of the family headed toward the police officers, deciding to pick his way through the thicket. Stepping into the grass, he came across something soft. A partially undressed female corpse lay face down. Philip turned it over and saw a familiar face. A desperate scream burst from his father's chest. It was Karina. She hadn't lost her phone like he thought. His little girl wasn't answering her phone because she had been robbed of her life. The realization of what had happened overwhelmed Mr. Vetrano. Hearing the screaming and yelling, the police rushed to him. They dragged Philippe away from his daughter's body, trying to explain that this was now a crime scene. Anything in the area was considered evidence. To prevent the evidence from being tampered with, the law enforcement officers asked the father of the deceased not to touch anything. On the way home, Mr. Vetrano thought a lot. He was tormented by how to tell his wife about their daughter's death. Images of the past flashed before his eyes. He remembered how on July 12, 1986, in Queens, their second daughter was born. Philip had been proud of her from an early age. She was obedient and well-mannered. He vividly remembered taking her to her first day of school, how well she did in her studies. Such education enabled her to earn a higher degree. Karina graduated from St. John's University with a master's degree in speech pathology. She had always dreamed of helping children and worked with autistic kids. His daughter was multifaceted. She loved to travel and write. She adored sports, especially running. Their shared passion brought them closer. She was his inspiration. The father remembered how jealously he treated her suitors. He so wanted her to be truly loved, hoping that she would eventually create a strong family like he and Kathy had and give him wonderful grandchildren. The return journey turned into an eternity. At the entrance to the house, Mr. Vetrano paused, taking a deep breath. I need to be strong to support my family. I have to pull myself together. The man commanded himself. His wife met him at the threshold. Fortunately, he didn't need to explain anything to her. She understood everything from her husband's face. Kathy cried, approached her husband, and hugged him. Soon, Karina's relatives and friends learned of the incident. They struggled to recover from the shock. Believing in the sudden death of the young woman was hard, let alone accepting its violent nature. Miss Vetrano had been subjected to a brutal attack. This was the conclusion reached by investigators. At first glance, it was obvious that the woman had resisted. Even in death, her fists remained clenched. Bruises and abrasions were found on her once young and healthy body, and her athletic clothing was torn. The autopsy showed that the back of the victim's skull had been damaged by a blunt object, probably a stone. However, the cause of death was asphyxiation. A clear mark was visible on the woman's neck. The forensic examination also revealed the intimate nature of the crime, violence. The experts' findings confirmed the police's initial suspicions. Earth and grass were found under the victim's fingernails, probably in an attempt to free herself from her attacker's grip and escape. Specialists examined her mouth and found her teeth knocked out and cracked in places. She had clearly bitten to defend herself. Even the woman's neck was covered with numerous scratches. She was grabbing with her hands, trying to force her attacker to let go of her. Karina did not want to die and fought hard for her life. Karina Vetrano's youngest daughter, Karina, had a variety of interests, but she especially loved writing. In 2013, she starred in a short movie by her friend and screenwriter Petros Georgiadis, which was based on a poem she had written, Paradox. In her blogs, the girl often addressed complex issues, often touching on the topics of love and the end of life. Shortly after this tragedy, new information was leaked to the media. In Princeton, Massachusetts, the body of another jogger was found among the tall grass. The woman, apparently also out for a walk in a secluded place, suffered a similar fate. At first glance, the cases were identical. Could there be another serial offender in America? The case was taken up by geneticists, who were tasked with comparing DNA samples collected from the crime scenes. As luck would have it, unidentified samples were found on both victims. Contrary to police expectations, the analysis revealed no connection between the crimes. 
It turned out that the DNA samples belonged to different people. Particularly intriguing is the story surrounding the DNA material taken from under her fingernails, on her back, and from Karina Vetrano's phone. The DNA was found in small quantities, but was deemed sufficient for analysis by experts. For a long time, this DNA remained the only lead in the investigation, giving a chance to identify the perpetrator. It is known that most life-ending crimes are committed by someone close to the victim, so the police could not dismiss any possibility. For this purpose, the victim's father provided his DNA as he was the one who first discovered his daughter's body. However, the timing for this procedure was poorly chosen. It took place on the day of Karina's funeral. Later, all of the woman's relatives also underwent a DNA test, which did not give any matches. Detectives decided to interview Karina's relatives and friends, finding out if Mrs. Vetrano had any enemies or ill-wishers. It turned out that there were none. Everyone respected and loved her. Then the investigators developed a new version. The deed was committed from base motives. Someone met the beautiful Karina in a secluded place and attacked her, giving in to base motives. At a loss, the investigation sought the public's help by offering a $10,000 reward for information that could lead to the perpetrator. The initiative received a widespread response. Detectives explored some 250 leads, conducted 600 genetic tests, and compiled more than 1,700 reports, all to no avail. It seemed that the perpetrator had not committed crimes before, at least not been caught for them, which further complicated the investigation. On August 31, 2016, a utility worker approached the police station with some information. At the time of Miss Vetrano's death, he was in a restricted area of the park and saw a man emerge from the bushes who then ran in a northerly direction. Based on his testimony, the New York Police Department developed and distributed a sketch of the suspect in December 2016. However, it took into account that the person depicted in the sketch could have been a passerby who was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Unfortunately, the release of the sketch of the suspected perpetrator provided no new information, and the investigation reached another long stalemate. On December 4, 2016, the Federal Bureau of Investigation joined the investigation into the death of Karina Vetrano. Initially, they developed a psychological profile of the perpetrator. According to FBI experts, the individual was very familiar with the area, especially the park where the incident occurred, suggesting the possibility that the assailant lived or continues to live nearby. However, fearing capture, he now avoids the area. It was clear he understood that the quiet, partially overgrown territory was ideal for concealing his act. Based on this theory, the police conducted screenings among local African-American men, but this did not yield the desired result. Chanel Lewis's life didn't particularly stand out from other young African-American individuals. He lived in one of Brooklyn's low-income housing complexes, about four, five miles from Spring Creek Park. Unemployed, Chanel lived with his mother, three sisters, and their children. Perhaps the only detail that set him apart was his diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia. Nonetheless, this didn't prevent him from graduating from a private school for students with emotional and behavioral issues. Former classmates remembered Chanel as a quiet loner. The kids constantly picked on him, one of them shared. Girls even intimidated and punched him. He had no friends. Another peer mentioned that Lewis sometimes fought back, but not effectively. He was often ridiculed for his clothing and appearance. Chanel always wore a hoodie and would smirk and walk away in difficult situations, earning him the nickname African Lizard. However, a fellow student, 17-year-old Danielle Muniz, described Chanel as a smart kid with good grades. He liked to show me funny videos on the bus, she recalled. I never saw him be cruel. Some sources reported that the young man once claimed he wanted to cut all the girls, asking during his time in middle school, what happens if I bring a knife to school? Dr. Edward Dana, the executive director of the school to which Chanel was transferred, commented on this. We received no reports of threats in middle school. During his time at our school, he had no disciplinary sanctions. I never heard him make threatening statements towards other students. 
Nonetheless, Chanel was a traumatized teenager who often experienced bullying. He dreamed of working in social services, wanting to help those in distress. When conflicts arose at home, he would wander the streets, frequently visiting the park. Lewis had several minor encounters with the police, two for violations in Spring Creek and one for urinating in public. In May 2016, another incident occurred when a local merchant reported Lewis for loitering in his store with a crowbar. Responding officers checked Chanel's ID and released him, as he had no prior incidents. However, this information was retained by the police and would later play a crucial role in the investigation into Karina Vetrano's death. In February 2017, Detective John Russo, who was involved in the investigation, remembered something significant. He had repeatedly seen a young man in a hoodie wandering the park. John even attempted to follow him once, intrigued by the individual's behavior. The young man walked slowly, stopping for long periods in front of houses near the park as if scouting them for potential burglaries. However, Russo lost sight of him when he contacted his colleagues by phone. The next day, following a store owner's report, a teenager matching the description came to the police's attention. Two months into the investigation, John Russo recalled this wanderer, thinking he might have seen or heard something relevant. Investigators zeroed in on Chanel Lewis after Detective Russo took a closer look at the young man's file. Chanel's peculiarities raised interest. The police began to inquire about him among acquaintances and teachers, and information surfaced that he had allegedly expressed a desire to harm girls. This news stirred concern and suspicion. With no other leads, officers decided to focus on Lewis. It was later discovered that during the time of Karina's death, Chanel was not at home. After an argument with his family, he had gone to the park. Upon his return, his appearance was disheveled, with torn clothing and visible bruises and abrasions. His mother inquired about what had happened, and Lewis claimed he had been attacked. His account matched the timeline with a witness's description of a man fleeing the park. Additionally, on August 3, 2016, Lewis's father, a former school principal, took him to the hospital for treatment of severe wounds, most of which were cuts, and he also had an injured hand. The investigators reviewed the medical records from that day and found the story plausible. However, they saw it differently, noting similarities between the events involving Chanel Lewis and Karina Vetrano. On February 4, 2017, Chanel was brought to the police station and voluntarily provided his DNA for analysis. Would a perpetrator willingly do this? Detectives wondered. The interrogation began on the morning of February 5th. Lewis admitted that he was indeed in the park around 5 p.m. on August 2nd, 2016, but clarified he was walking on dirt paths, not through the thickets, and listening to music. He confessed to encountering a young woman jogging with her phone in her hand. When asked by detectives if something happened when he encountered her, Chanel nodded and quietly said, Yes. Everyone was stunned. His response was vague, indicating confusion. I was angry. One thing led to another. What happened, happened, he finally stated clearly. Investigators were skeptical of this semi-admission, fearing it might provoke doubt among jurors during a trial. They waited for Chanel to elaborate. I was walking in the park, trying to distract myself from a family argument. Then I met a woman. She was alone. I decided to follow her. When she passed by me, I grabbed her shoulders, threw her to the ground, and hit her face about five times so she couldn't scream. My punches knocked out several of her teeth, injuring my hand, Chanel recalled. He also added that the struggle lasted about five minutes. Miss Vetrano fiercely resisted, scratching and biting. To avoid attracting attention, Lewis dragged her from the path into tall grass where he attempted to undress and assault her. She was shocked, but continued to resist. Chanel then forcefully strangled her until he realized she was no longer alive. When asked if he knew the victim beforehand, he replied, I did not know her before this. It all happened by chance. The motive for the act became even more unexpected and bizarre. It turns out, loud music played by a neighborhood gang member for hours on end triggered Chanel's hatred 
and uncontrollable aggression. These negative emotions were unleashed on the unfortunate woman, a strange reason for an act indeed. Investigators' confusion was dispelled when DNA comparison results matched perfectly. Microscopic traces found on the victim's body and phone belonged to Chanel. Consequently, the police and the prosecutor concluded the case was solved and ready for court. However, the motive still seemed implausible. It's possible Chanel had noticed Karina before, as he often frequented the park and might have seen her with her father. He liked her and decided to approach her. But after being rejected, he became angry and struck her, and the situation spiraled out of control. This scenario would have been more understandable. On November 5th, 2018, the trial against Chanel Lewis began. Despite his earlier statements to the authorities, Lewis pleaded not guilty, a stance echoed by his family, denying his involvement in the crime. The prosecution charged Lewis with ending a life and sexual assault, facing him with a sentence ranging from 25 years to life imprisonment. The debate over Lewis's guilt not only unfolded in the courtroom, but also spilled over into the media. Lewis's defense team stirred the pot, pointing out alleged legal violations during his arrest. Along with various news outlets, they claimed racial bias and discrimination. However, the judge dismissed these allegations as baseless, emphasizing that the investigation complied with legal standards. The prosecution presented tangible evidence and DNA analysis findings. The defense argued that the evidence was insufficient and contaminated, given the large number of people at the crime scene, including the victim's father who discovered her body. Forensic biologist Linda Rosano stated the odds of the DNA belonging to someone other than Lewis were one in six trillion. The prosecutor also introduced Lewis's phone records, revealing his internet searches on second chances and forgiveness in Catholicism, prompting the question, what sin was Chanel hoping to atone for? The release of Lewis's confession video sparked further controversy, with his lawyers arguing he was under immense pressure, leading to a coerced confession. They suspected the police of fabricating evidence, claiming the recording began only after Lewis was pressured and that the search of his home violated protocols. The defense suggested the investigation into Karina Vetrano's death was initially botched, with public pressure mounting for an arrest leading to Lewis becoming a scapegoat. The jury was struck by the defense's powerful arguments. After hearing both sides, they were unable to reach a conclusive verdict. On November 21, 2018, the judge declared a mistrial, with a retrial initially scheduled for January 22, 2019, but later postponed to March 2019. After five hours of deliberation, Chanel Lewis was ultimately found guilty of Karina Vetrano's death and sentenced to life without parole on July 23, 2019. The defense's delay tactics included citing an anonymous source to allege misconduct by a juror, suggesting jury pressure and a conspiracy, with some calling the trial a lynch mob. The case, seemingly straightforward at first, ignited widespread prejudices and fears in society. Karina Vetrano's death touched many, serving as a grim reminder for women to be cautious. Did justice prevail? In any case, a young woman's life was cut short and Chanel Lewis was sentenced to life imprisonment. Both families lost their children, the hope remains that the truth was indeed uncovered. Otherwise, an innocent man is behind bars while the perpetrator remains free. Thanks for watching, guys. That was Jack with you. Subscribe to the channel. There are many shocking stories ahead.